I had this great uh, New Year's message for you guys, and, um, and I love that first Sunday after New Year's. It's actually my second favorite Sunday to be in church. I know it's a little weird, but it's kind of the newness of everything, and we have the newness in Christ, and it just, it just feels right that first Sunday. But because of certain, some circumstances with my mother, I wasn't able to preach, and Robbie did an okay job, you know, filling in. So, uh, and by the way, I heard that since I wasn't here last week, my name got mentioned like five times, so you're about to hear a lot about Robbie, so get ready. <laughs> Um, but instead, I get to preach another special day for America. No, I'm not talking about the Super Bowl, and it's actually tomorrow. I'm talking about Groundhog's Day. I mean, tomorrow is Groundhog's Day. That's a big day for us. We get to find out if winter is finally coming to an end. I mean, that's what Phil's going to tell us, right? And uh, it's also another big day. It's going to be my daughter's Madison's 17th birthday, so I'll say happy birthday to her real quick. But but we'll talk about Groundhog's Day a little bit. It's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a special day to me because I don't know if most of y'all know this, but uh, my degree is in meteorology and I started out as a weatherman. And it's kind of like Weatherman's Day. I mean, if you'll remember the movie Groundhog's Day, Bill Murray is the TV weather guy and he goes and he's covering Groundhog's Day and then, of course, all the events that happen there. But because it's talking about the seasons and whether he sees his shadow and the sun and all this kind of stuff, it's kind of become... I think it's Weatherman's Day, so y'all can wish me happy Weatherman's Day, it's, it's fine. But, um, but you know the story about what Punxsutawney Phil's going to do tomorrow. He's going to come out of his very plush cave, or whatever he lives in, and they're going to bring him out, and they're going to say, does he see his shadow, so is the sun shining, or is it not? And if he sees his shadow, he's scared, and he hides back in for six more weeks, and winter continues. And if he doesn't see it, hey, winter's over, put on your swimsuits, it's time for spring. I saw an interesting fact this week about that. He's only about 40% accurate. So it is more accurate, the, the coin flip that is going to determine the kickoff today is more accurate than Punxsutawney Phil is as to uh, forecasting when winter's going to end. But, you know, this is what Phil's really doing. He's just playing a big game of hide and seek. That's all he's doing. He's, in, he's hiding, and he's going to come out and seek whether or not winter's over. And, you know, I think it's going to be easier for me to ask you the inverse question here. Who hasn't played hide-and-seek? Anybody? No, no one. Everyone has played hide-and-seek. Hide-and-seek is a game that we play from the time we're infants all the way up until the time that we're, you know, headed for the, for, uh, for the end and, and, and to visit God in, in, in the sky. And, um, we all do it. It's a fun game. It's, everyone can do it. You can do it when it's, the sun's out, when it's raining. You can do it inside, outside, any time of day, any age. Um, who are my hiders in here? Who really enjoy hiding? Go ahead. You can raise your hand. Who, who are the hiders? Okay. And then who are my seekers? Who likes to go and seek? Okay, wait a minute. Some of y'all didn't raise your hand. You don't understand the game. It's hide and seek. There's nothing else, right? It's hide and seek. So you've got to be one of the two. I'm a hider. That's what I love. I love going and finding that really special place that, that I think no one's going to be able to find me and try to fool people by where I'm hiding and, and interesting things like getting under the bed sheets and acting like you're under the, you know, they don't see you because you're under the sheets or you set up pillows under the sheets and, and you're actually under the bed and just all those kinds of things. I love that part of, of hide and seek. Um, I have a story about hide and seek. Um, I'm a little young to remember this, but I've been told it many times. I was about two or three, I guess. Um, we'll, we'll call it three. And uh, my aunt uh, used to watch my, me and my sisters, my two older sisters, because my parents were at work. And so um, we were at her house and she lived right, just right across the street from us. And so we were playing hide and seek, and so it was my turn to hide, and my sisters were going to find me, and so I go and I find a wonderful hiding place. I get into the back of my aunt's closet, back behind her clothes, and we're talking about, this is an old house, right? So we're talking walls that are nice and thick, big old heavy wooden doors. This isn't like today's houses where you can paper thin walls and you can hear everything. I mean, this is a quiet, dark place, and guess what three-year-olds do in quiet, dark places? They fall asleep. So I fell asleep, and so my sisters were looking for me, and they couldn't find me. So they go to my aunt, and my poor aunt. They say, we can't find Jay. 
So she takes off looking for me. She searches the entire house and cannot find me. So she has lost me. So my two uh, older cousins, they're twins, they're about 12 years older than me, so they'd be about 15 or so here. They get home from school. It's been probably 30 minutes. They're home from school. She sends them out looking. Maybe Jay went out the door. Maybe I wasn't watching. He got out the back door or something. So they're looking in the pasture. They're looking in the barn. They're looking in the shop. They're looking under the house. They're looking everywhere. They go across the street to my house to see maybe if I wandered back over there. No, they can't find me. So eventually, it was like an hour, as as how it's been told to me, someone finally opened that closet door and looked in there and found me asleep in that closet. You know, we all play hide and seek. We play it as a game, but we also play it with God. And so I just told you kind of a literal example of hide and seek, an actual example, but figuratively, we all play this game with, with God. Um, and it goes something like this, we hide, he seeks. Now by hiding, I mean that we do our best to place ourselves out of fellowship with Jesus. Unbelievers choose not to accept and believe in the redemptive power of our Messiah, and believers allow pride and self-interest and doubt to creep between them and their Savior. And you know, the worst part of it is most of the time we wind up hiding from God and we do not even know that we're doing it. When we are out of his favor and not living for him, we are essentially hiding from the Lord. Isaiah 59 and verse 2 says it this way, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Now, I don't want you to misinterpret that verse, and and it's done sometimes. God's not the one doing the hiding here. God does not hide from us. It is our sin nature that is causing us to hide from God's goodness, his grace, and his kingdom. Well, I've got a few biblical examples here. We're in very good company when it comes to hiding from God. There are numerous instances where we find men and women from the Bible doing their best to hide from God. Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 says, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Moses hid his face from God in Exodus 3. Jonah, you remember Jonah? He ran from God and he tried to hide when he was told to go to Nineveh. David, he hid away in caves when he was pursued by King Samuel, uh, King Saul during 1 Samuel. Now, these, again, are some literal occasions where we see individuals hiding. And again, what I'm talking about today is the more figurative form of hiding. And again, this is where we separate from God's grace and from his glory. Now, there's another famous man from the Bible that found himself turning away from God and doubting God and questioning God and ultimately running away from God. This man actually is one of my favorite men from the Bible because I can see some of him, his good and his bad, in my actions. The man that we're going to focus on today is the Apostle Peter. Now, you might be going, Peter? I mean, Peter's a great man, really? Hiding from God? Well, let's take a look at Peter's life a little bit as the Bible tells us. We know Peter was a great leader in the early Christian church. In fact, he was a principal leader in the first church in Jerusalem. He took the lead in Acts chapter 1 when a replacement for the betrayer Judas needed to be selected. In Acts 1 verse 15 says this, In those days Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. In Acts 2 he delivered the sermon at Pentecost. Following that sermon, the 3,000 were baptized and added to the church. In Acts 3, we see a miracle performed by Peter when he and John heal the lame man at the beautiful gate. And soon after, he chastises the onlookers from Solomon's portico and preaches Christ to them. In Acts 4, he is arrested but has the boldness to address the council in the name of Jesus Christ. And in Acts 15, we see Peter as the head of the Jerusalem council. His name is second only to Jesus in the number of times that it appears in the Gospels. I could go on and on and on with examples of Peter as a teacher, 
and a preacher and a leader and an evangelist, a middle miracle worker and a mentor. Peter lived for roughly 30 years after the resurrection of Christ. He wrote two books of the New Testament. Peter was a leader in the first church in Jerusalem and along with Paul is considered one of the founders of the church in Rome. He was crucified but because he felt unworthy to die in the same manner that Christ did, he requested that he would be crucified upside down. This is the Peter that we know, a great and mighty and wise leader. Let's look at Peter's first encounter with Christ, and we'll find that in Luke chapter 5 and verse 11. You can follow along with me in your Bibles, but the verses will be up on the screen. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, He was standing by the lake of Gisenaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing But as your word, I will let down your nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord." For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So Peter recognizes him as Lord. And what does he do? He follows Jesus. Now, this began an incredible relationship between Jesus and Peter. We see the importance of this relationship in John chapter 1 and verse 42, when Jesus specially names Peter. We saw previously that he was mentioned as Simon or Simon Peter. But Jesus specially names Peter, and it says, He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. Now, the the significance of calling him Cephas is great. Cephas means rock in Aramaic and is translated to Petros in Greek, which is Peter in English. Jesus didn't do or say anything without intended great purpose. He intended Peter to be just that, a rock. A rock for the other disciples and a rock for the early church. Jesus didn't go around changing the other earlier followers' names, and he certainly didn't give any of them, other than Peter, as as significant a name as rock. Peter quickly became, at the very least, the vocal leader of the apostles. We see him as the principal spokesman for the group. The examples of Christ's teaching and working with Peter reveal the regard Jesus had for him and the knowledge and the faith that he had in Peter to carry on his work once he was gone. Now, can you imagine being Peter? I mean, what an opportunity to be face to face with Christ on a daily basis. I mean, learning directly from the Son of God, I mean, he's basically walking side by side with God I mean, he became a great friend to Jesus. I mean, if anyone should have had it made, it was Peter, the rock, the leader, right there with Jesus. And there's no mistake, there's no mistake that Peter knew exactly who Jesus was. And we see that in Luke chapter 9 and verse 18 through 20, when Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. Now it happened that he was praying alone. The disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah. And others, 
the one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, rock, he answered, the Christ of God. But yet, even Peter would play a seemingly nonstop game of hide and seek with God, where he would let his humanity step between him and Jesus. So let's look at some examples of that. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 30, as Robert talked about, when Peter sinks when he takes his eyes off of Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, verse 24, Peter is filled with selfless ambition, contending that he is the greatest disciple. In Mark chapter 10, we see that Peter is offended that James and John attempted to gain a greater reward. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 22 to 23, Peter rebukes Jesus, leading Jesus to tell Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. He calls him Satan. In Matthew 17, Peter wrongly compares Jesus with mere mortal men. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 27, Peter questions Jesus on what his reward will be since he had given up everything for Christ. In John chapter 13 and verse 8, Peter resists Jesus' intent to wash his feet. In Matthew 26, Peter fails and he falls asleep not once, but twice in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke chapter 22, verses 54 through 62, we all know this one. Peter denies knowing Jesus three times. Now, Peter's actions are no different than mine or yours. His walk with Christ was filled with a lack of focus. It was filled with selfish ambition and pride. It was filled with him thinking that he knew better than Jesus. He belittled God. He questioned God. He turned away from the glory of Christ. He failed God, and ultimately, he denied having any identity in Christ. Now, how many of us are guilty of one of those? Or all of those? Or how about all of those just this morning? I know I am. And each time that we do one of these things, one of those things that Peter, the great Peter Rock did, we are hiding from the glory and the goodness and the joy in Christ. We find ourselves napping in the back corner of a closet while God's desire for us is still always continually seeking. Peter's final act of hiding occurs after Jesus had been arrested and tried, wrongly sentenced to death, beaten, bruised, pierced, crucified, and put to death. Peter ran. Let's read this in John. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, very simply, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. No. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 
153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Now, there's some astonishing similarities between this story of Peter running and Jesus finding him in that very first story that we read where Jesus first met Peter as a fisherman. But we see here, what does Peter do when all goes wrong? When Jesus, who had said he was God, was dead? What, what does Peter do? He runs. He runs away from God and he goes back to where he is most comfortable. He goes back to just being a fisherman. I've got another hide-and-seek story for you. Um, This one happened at our elders' retreat that we had back in September. It was uh, Robbie, uh, Mark, Warhol, and I. And look, we did a lot of hard work, let me tell you. A lot of hard work when we were at this retreat. Um, A lot of praying, a lot of time. But there was a little bit of time to kind of relax and do some things. And so we were at my place, and I've got some four-wheelers. And so when it got tonight, we played... um, Uh, hide-and-seek or in the dark on four-wheelers and so the way we played this was one person would go and hide and the other people the other two would have to go and try to basically headlight them right just get their headlights on them so I I have a distinct advantage this is my property I've been all over it I kind of know where things are so I can kind of creep around even in the dark with no headlights on and not run into things but poor here we go Robbie he, first of all, I don't know if he was totally comfortable on the four-wheeler, but um, he, it was his time to hide. And so he goes and he hides, and so Mark and I, and we had to leave our engines on so we couldn't hear him and all that kind of stuff. So, so he goes and he takes off, and we give him an amount of time to go hide, and so he goes and hides, and then Mark and I start going and looking for him. And so it wasn't very long. It was maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute or so after we had started looking for him, that um, I've got motion lights up at my house, and all of a sudden I saw the motion lights come on. And so I knew exactly where Robbie was. And Robbie goes back and tells a story that when those lights came on, he he didn't know that there were motion lights there, so those motion lights came on, and, you know, you're creeping around in the dark on a four-wheeler, and all of a sudden these lights come on, and he said it, it really freaked him out. But we knew exactly where he was at that point, and within 30 seconds, we were there, and we had him. And so... Robbie's not a very good hider. Let's just, let's just put it out there. He's not a very good hider. But you know, just like Mark and I were able to easily find Robbie, God knows exactly where we are. As much as we try to run and hide, as much as we try to further ourselves from God, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, as much as we think that God doesn't care or have any interest in us, God seeks See, there's a light shining down on us at all times. The same kind of light that flashed in Robbie's eyes. And that light is sourced only through the power and the glory of the cross. We can't hide from God. Jeremiah 23 and verse 24 says, Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Hebrews 4 in verses 12 to 13 states it this way. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And you know what? He did that with Peter. Every time the flesh of Peter got the better of him, Christ was seeking him. You see, when Peter was sinking in that ocean, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. When Peter was selfish and he contended that he was the greatest, Jesus promised him a kingdom and he prayed for him. When Peter was offended, Jesus rebuked him and taught him about the duty of service. When Peter rebukes Jesus, Jesus responds by calling Peter Satan 
and instantly shows him his wicked ways. When Peter questions Jesus' deity during the transfiguration of Christ, God declares his son. When Peter questions Jesus, Jesus reminds him of the kingdom that he will inherit. When Peter resists the glory of Christ during the washing of feet, Jesus teaches the lesson of submission. When Peter falls asleep, Jesus warns of temptation and the weakness of the flesh. When Peter denies knowing Jesus three times, Jesus looks upon Peter, and Peter know, knows that he did wrong, and he repents. And finally, when Peter ran away, when he went back to being a fisherman, when he went back to his comfort zone, to where he felt safe, to do what he knew best, Jesus seeks Peter. And he reveals himself to Peter, and he tells him, feed his sheep and to follow me. And soon after that, we see the ultimate transition of Peter from the man full of self-doubt and selfishness and foolish pride, from the man that questioned Jesus, denied him, and ultimately hid from him, to become the leader of the early church that we find in Acts. Peter would finally become rock. You see, even through these acts of separation from Christ, God continually sought after Peter. And there was glory and there was wonder in store from Peter. Now, there's a lot of you listening today that are, that are either new believers in Christ or you've redirected yourself in Christ, and there's plenty here that have, have known Christ for a long time. And we all hide. We all find ourselves hiding from Christ. You know, there's a wonderful world out there for us when we stop trying to hide from God and we start doing the seeking. I think Peter actually said it best in his first book, in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. He writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had, hard, you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even, through refined by, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are, res you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see, whether you're new in Christ or you've been saved for many years, we all find ourselves playing this childish game of hide and seek with Christ. I mean, sometimes it's in a deep, dark place, and other times it's just because we lose focus for a moment. But the miraculous news is wherever you find yourself hidden, it is never, ever so great that God can't or won't find you. You see, we started hiding from God in the garden. Adam and Eve didn't want to be found. They hid. They tried to hide in the best place they knew they could. And yet, God found them. Jonah tried to hide. 
He went a lot of places to hide. He wound up in the belly of a fish because he was trying to hide. God always found him and delivered him. We do that. Peter did it. We hide and God seeks. But his word promises, and we read it right there in 1 Peter, his word promises that there is an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. The promise is is this. It's very simple. God seeks, and we find. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for uh, your glory and your grace, Lord, and that even when we fail you and we separate ourselves from you, Lord, that you are continually looking for us and seeking us. And whether it be um, through something great that you show to us or a lesson that we need to be learned or whatever the case may be, Lord, you're there for us and you're constantly seeking us. You constantly want that relationship to be restored and made whole, Lord, and I just thank you for that. And the only reason we have that and the only reason we have that ability is because of Christ. You selfishly sending your son to this earth so that he may die for us and so that he may bridge that gap for us, Lord. I thank you for the cross and I thank you for the redemptive power of the cross, Lord. Be with us as we go this week, Lord, and just help us to remember these things that when we fail you and when we put walls between you and us, when we hide in that closet, Lord, just help us to remember that you're always there still looking for us and seeking us. You're always reaching out your hand for us as we seek into that ocean, Lord. We just love you so much. Be with us as we go this week, and amen.